Center for the Government. I um, recently have gotten more into Vim. I've always used it um, as my text editor, but I don't really do a lot of configurations. Um, and then when Steven started the meetup group, I was like, I should know more about Vim. So I finally decided I would start and try to, um, you know, configure my Vim. So this is this is sort of my journey of configuring it over the last like couple hours of the last week, and it's just a, a couple things that seem to um, make Vim work a lot better for me. So uh, I'll walk you through it. Um, I think everybody should configure Vim. Um, you should have a VimRC, and I've worked in year for years without having one uh, or not much of one, and um, there's a couple reasons why. Um, obviously, you can reduce your keystrokes because if you if there's a lot of Vim commands you're issuing all of the time, then you wouldn't have to issue them every time you start a new instance of Vim. You can just have them automatically imported whenever you start the text editor. Uh, I think that it helps enforce best practices for um, programming languages because uh, for, for style, mainly for style, uh, because you can set your tabs or your spacing to be a certain way. And, um, you can also limit the amount of like, the amount of width that you go, that you'll allow, that, that you'll allow your text editor to go. You can like wrap the lines and everything. And make it, um, I don't do a lot of that in here, but um, it's good for, for, for etiquette for style. Uh, it makes Vim easier to use. When you, when you start understanding what's happening, uh, in the Vim, in your in the default Vim, um, you can understand. You can start when you start researching the things that you can do with Vim. You can learn more about like the things, the abilities, the capability Vim has that can help you to um, to master things quicker. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is, it it will make it easier, and I can show you some examples. Um, for when you're coding, like the specific things you need to do. And it's fun. I found when I was um, writing the VimRC up, it was actually fun to read. There were a lot of like debates about the certain styles and the certain configurations you should include and different reasoning for, for why. And it was interesting to see what other programmers or technical writers, whoever was using it, what they were thinking was best for, um, for them. So this here is uh, what Vim kind of looks like before you configure it. Now I'm in, in here, I'm using spaces, I'm not using tabs. But um, the first thing I thought when I went to write my VimRC was what do I need to do to, what do I do with Vim right now? So um, there's a lot of VimRC files you can find that are already written. There's a ton of them. And some of them are really amazing, but I don't know what half of the stuff is that's happening in there. So for me, working from scratch was the way to go. And first I had to consider what it is that I do. So what do I do? I write new code. I, I have to work with old code. I have to debug my new code and my old code. I start to replace. I reformat code and I use copy and paste. Um, it's not the end, whatever. But I, um, those are the things I do most of the time. Those are the things that I tend to repeat a lot. So, when I see code that looks like this, like when I first, when I, and this happens all the time, I'll go onto a new server, and or my computer or whatever, and I open up a file, and it's all black and white, and I'm like, oh my god, I can't, I can't, this, this, you don't know what's happening here. There's, you don't have any color coding. It's, it's tough. I have to have color coding. So the first thing I always do, and I do this. So I've had no RC files that have like this one line in them forever and it's a syntax on. So what that does is it enables color. So now you can see kind of what's going on. And that's, this is just the default Vim colors for Mac, I guess. Or this really looks like pretty much the colors I see on the, on the servers I work on too. And I don't change my color scheme, I haven't yet. Um, I know a lot of people do. I don't because this is what I, this is a standard color scheme I see when I'm working in someone else's environment as root. And um, it's, to me, it just is a huge difference right there. That's almost good enough for me. Like, but there's more. So one, so one thing I do a lot is search. And before I modified my VimRC, searching was just using the forward slash or the question mark. And I would, so here, I've got this silly little code I wrote, and I'm trying to find dollar song. So as you can see, I'm using forward slash to search from the top of the file down, the top of the cursor, and I find the first instance right there. With VimRC, 
I have added a uh, command called uh, set ink search, which stands for incremental search. So as I'm typing, here I've only typed forward slash SON. I haven't even hit enter, and yet this has already started highlighting. So it knows, it's, it, it reads the code as I'm typing, which is awesome because I don't even have to hit enter, and I know that what I'm searching for is right there. That's, I thought that was pretty powerful. Another thing, um, another one, and it, oh, it works the same with the forward slash or the question mark. They work in the same way, and it just, because it's in my bookmark C, I don't have to type colon set ink search here. It just happens, you know, it's, as soon as I zip up my script, this is, it's already inherited. Another thing I found that was cool was HL search, just highlights, it's a highlighted search. So I've got the incremental search already happening. So as I'm typing SON, you know, this is, this is, uh, being found. But then also after I hit enter, now every um, occurrence of song is highlighted. So that, that's on the screen. So I mean obviously this, this continues. But so now I see every, I can just at a glance, there's all the dollar song. Like all the things I'm looking for, they're right there. All this, the search string. <coughs> Seems pretty cool. Uh, something I sometimes do, and it was, I do it enough that I thought I could justify putting it in my um, my configuration is uh, ignoring case. This could be dangerous and there's ways around it, but what, I, um, what I'm doing here is I'm searching for Mary uh, in lowercase and I'm matching Mary with a capital M. It doesn't matter what the case is, it'll match it because um, it, it doesn't, it ignores case. So it could be a capital R in the middle of that and it would still match, it doesn't matter. So I said that. Um, but then I was like, the smart case looked really good too. So um, it's basically um, in case sensitive searching. So I can search for lowercase or uppercase, but if I type a capital M, if I start typing any capital letter, it interprets it as I'm obviously looking for something specific. And so then it says, okay, case matters in this search because why else would I have typed a capital letter? And it interprets that into its own, all on its own. And uh, it matches Mary instead of Mary with the lowercase. Which is also pretty cool. So it does. Uh, so with smart case, you keep your ignore case, but then if you type a capital, it, it ignores ignore case. Is that basically? Uh, it? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So and you can have them both, and I don't. I don't think order matters. I haven't tried putting smart case first, but I'm pretty sure that it's cool. Yeah, and it's pretty cool. I thought. So. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. So um, I guess I wanted to say it here. I think that. Um, if you have your ignore case set and you um, don't want to go in and change your MRC and you need to match something specific, and the uh, smart case, while smart case will get it if you have a capital letter in it, but maybe you know you may want to um, search for something that's all lowercase and you don't want to match anything that's uppercase. Well, smart case doesn't work in the opposite way. So if you're only looking for lowercase and you don't want to match, like you wouldn't want to match capital Mary, it's not going to work. So you can turn it off temporarily just by at the end of your search string doing backslash C, backslash capital C will um, put case sensitivity back on. So it would be a question mark Mary and then backslash capital C and you can have whatever search string there you want and it will ignore. It will ignore ignore, if you know what I mean. Another thing that does um, help me in programming is finding closure pairs. So you have a block of code, it's usually a lot longer than this, and you need to find that, that closing curly brace or bracket or parentheses, whatever it is, you, you know. It would, if you had your cursor set here, it would automatically highlight there. If you have your cursor set here, it'll automatically highlight there. It automatically highlights the end. So here my cursor is set, and there it's highlighted. That's a big deal. Like, I've spent a lot of time trying to find those matching curly braces, and okay. especially, it can be a- That's a default one. It's what? It's a default option. It wasn't, I, mean, I, I thought that too, and I, but I. Because I don't have any, any set show match in my VMRC file, and I'll open my program, and I it still find. I thought that when I had mine, and I might just be running an old version. Hmm? It's a default option. Oh, default option. Because I think. I'm, I'm, used to, I'm used to using the shift five. <laughs> oh, the percent. The percent, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But, but that will help you to go up and down. Yeah, right. Yeah, you jumps to the Yeah. Um, I think it, it might depend on the particular system because I'm sure there's probably sort of a, there, there are default configuration files. So some operating systems might have it on by default and others might not. Like we use, we use uh, Sonos for a lot of our work. Um, and that might, in its configuration, 
solution that might not be on by default. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about my Mac, and I'm also talking about Red Hat 6.6. Well, I would think Red Hat would be the same, but I don't know, maybe some. Maybe yeah, it does look like it's default in my system, too. <laughs> but whatever, it's, there's still that, um, there's that option. I don't know. If, if it is off on a given system, I guess that's how you would turn it back on. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, like I said, a couple hours, whatever. Good to know anyway that that's what's doing it. It's still really handy. And there are some systems I've been on that don't do that. So, whatever. Um, but thanks for pointing it out. It's good to know. Um, and also, it's also good to know that it can't hurt you to put it in your WebMRC. That's right. Even if it's already default, it's fine. Um, you can duplicate your efforts and it's totally fine. Um, adjusting tab. This is a little bit hairy. I, I spent some time trying to figure it out because there's a lot of ways to adjust your tab spacing. Yeah. And um, I noticed for a while I was just using the default Linux tab, which is eight columns. Eight columns is ridiculous. I see a lot of head shaking or for the people that are here. There's a, yeah, there's a lot of head shaking. How about set expand tab? Let's do that. Okay, well, so um, expand tab is something I have considered. Uh, what it does, what Mike's talking about, is it changes um, your tabs to spaces. So when you um, hit a tab, even if it's eight columns or four columns or whatever, you said you've got it set up, it'll change it all to spaces so that um, so that when someone else opens it, perhaps, it <laughs> doesn't have your same configuration. It doesn't put all these like, massively large tabs everywhere. The, the default eight columns is awful when you work on HTML files and you have many, many drop down boxes. Yeah. Oh, right. Because you just get, you keep scrolling over and over and over. It's crazy. Well, eight columns is terrible. So there's actually something called tab stop, which is the default, um, it'll change the default Linux variable from eight columns to whatever columns you want it to be. Um, I read different varying things. A lot of people do change tab stop. I decided that for my uses, I would change soft tab stop and shift width. These um, two uh, variables are, are are good enough for me for what I do because if you change the tab stop, if you change the actual default Linux one, it can affect the way that when, when you print something, it can affect the way it prints out. It it just doesn't seem like something you should change with. It's a configuration, it's a Linux configuration. It's more than just Vim. It's you know you don't want to you don't want to mess with it. I, I don't want to mess with it. Other people will have no problem with it, but I'm not that talented. So I messed with soft tab stop, which is, uh, so okay, so right. So tab stop is the like, the amount of width, in fact I have a note of it because it's, it took me a minute. It's the width of a tab character, okay? And tab stop is the amount of spaces you'll have in each tab character. So here I want two spaces in my tab. I like, I actually really like a small tab. Maybe it's from using the eight tab so long that now I need the smallest tab possible. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of the modern programming guidelines are too, too, too yeah. anyways, yeah. And if, if, if when you work with YML files, you know, configuration files, eight columns give you a hard time. Eight columns is crazy. I mean, you're crazy. You should use at least, if you got it, four is the, four is the maximum. YML moduling pro will work on indentation. And if you're messed up with your indentation, then you're gone. Wow. I spent maybe two, three hours to just figure out the what indentation it's asking for. <laughs> yeah, so there's also things that can help you figure out the type of indentation that's, uh, that's in the current code you're looking at. Um, but anyway, um, so the thing about soft tab stuff that's worth noting is that if you want to actually have, if you want to have this actually look like a tab. I mean, it looks like a tab. Sure, that, I mean, before it was spaces. You can't really tell the difference here. Um, I think, in fact, if I go to the next one, slide, I have it. Right. Okay. So you can see here. I I put in this in my Vim configuration. Set list, set list, target list, tab. I don't want that in my Vim configuration permanently because what it does is it puts this. It it specifies if it's a tab or not. Now, soft tab stop. You're hitting tab. You're getting two spaces, but it doesn't count as a Linux, as the Linux definition of a tab, unless it's eight columns, because I never reset expand tab, or um, a tab stop. So because of that, 
it doesn't actually consider it a tab. So um, if I hit, so tab stop divided by soft tab stop equals the tab strokes to system tab, which is eight divided by two equals four. So if I hit tab four times, I can get this little thing telling me that it is in fact a tab. I know it sounds like chaos, and it doesn't really matter for what I do in Perl, it doesn't matter. I don't need it to register as a Linux Vim tab, it doesn't matter. And maybe also with what I do, I could just save the step and do tab stop, I don't know. You guys talk to me about it, I don't know. But um, anyway, so I wanted to show you what the tab actually looks like. This is also me just hitting tab once. This is the two space tab, but again, Vim, isn't listing it as a tab. Now, the, the reason why I set, and this is back here, the reason why I set shift width is because I want to still be able to shift my text two spaces at a time, or one, or yeah, two spaces at a time to the right, or two spaces at a time to the left, just like I could do with the default configuration. So these two should always match, because otherwise it's, it's just more chaos, like if I have a a tab that's two spaces and a, a shift that's four spaces, it doesn't make any sense. This also helps it so that I can backspace um, two characters as well, so I don't have to backspace one at a time, which can also be a pain if you're expecting it to be a tab. So there's that. Okay. Oh, and the um, other thing that I've started finding is really helpful, especially when I'm going through log files. Log files uh, at my work are just incredible. So when I'm going through them, sometimes it helps me to actually set the cursor line. So I have this line that lets me know exactly where my cursor is. Sure, it's highlighted here, but in a log file and after hours of staring at something, it's not as obvious as this line is. So this lets me know at a glance exactly where I'm at. And that's helpful, especially, again, when I'm searching, if I want to search down or up from where my cursor is, it's helpful to me. Oh, and um, the last thing I have set is the ruler. So I'm, I don't like line numbers. It takes up a lot of space. It will be right here, I have all the line numbers. And I, I think that it gets copied if I, if I copy with my mouse, the line yes. numbers will get copied. In. And that's just awful, it's ugly. And it's hard for copying, uh, it's hard for pasting. So I don't like that. So I use this. And I really like to have this. And now this is default. Um, if you're in escape, if you hit, if you're in escape mode, you'll see that. But this will stay on the screen no matter what mode you're in. You can always see what uh, line and what line and character position your cursor is at. And that's extremely. This this 21 here is really important to me because I sometimes get errors that are to the character of where the where the problem is. So line 13, character 21 is bad. I can go right to it. I know where I'm at and I see the problem. That's really, really helpful, I think. Uh, so, in conclusion, this is, um, this is the VimRC I just showed you guys. It's got everything except for that thing that puts the bracket in when it's a tab, and or the greater sign when it's a tab. And um, so when you go to make your VimRC, you need to consider, you need to research, and then you need to write it. So first consider what you do, and uh, what you think you can improve. Research what other people are doing, because there's a lot of people that do the same exact thing we do, and that have very different VimRCs. And then write it, and the way to write it is right here, this command vim, uh, this is in my home directory, tilde slash, and it's dot vimrc, that's the file. You hit enter, you're in vim mode, type all this stuff in, or whatever you want, obviously it's not gonna be the same for you as it is for me. And then um, the only thing I don't think I mentioned is how to put comments in the VimRC, which I have a slew of them because I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, it's just a double quote, and then what you have on the line with the double quote is your comments. And it, it'll wrap, but I didn't want to wrap it um, for this presentation because I didn't think it would be pretty. So are there any questions? About what? <laughs> about the VIM configuration or any other questions that I might be able to answer. Have you played around with the multiple VIM RCs? Like having one, like if you have one in each directory? I have not, and I saw some things about it. I just ran out of time with making this one. Oh, yeah, sure. sure. And there's also like plugins um, and, and managers, to, right. there's a whole bunch of things that 
I just felt like it was more than I needed to do. And then once, once you go through it and you set them all up and you like the way you just do make them RC and all write it right out. Oh, that's that cool. Want. Yeah. Mike, there's a, there's a command that called M MK then RC. Oh, Steven learned something today. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a question? I think it'll make it in the directory that you're editing in, Steven. So, so I can <coughs> do it in. Yeah. Use uh, visual mode and command line mode. Yeah, you can use um, visual mode, sure. Um, Is it used just for cut and paste or what? Um, well, that's what I use it for, but you can also use, like here I'm in visual, the visual mode, but I can use it to, I should be able to use it. To, yeah, to shift everything up. You see how everything got shifted yeah. over to where my cursor was in visual mode? If I, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, you can use it for shifting. You can also use it. Um, you can use it for if you're going to yank lines, like. Um, so visual mode is just for like selecting lines or characters. And that's what I use it for. I don't know if anyone else. Uh, but you can also like visualize, and then you can yank those, like block of four lines yanked. So I just yank those, and then I'm going to paste them, just like you said, copy paste. And what's command line mode? Command line mode. Okay. So that's visual mode. Command line mode, which I don't know that I use. I don't know. I normal mode is that, right? Yes, I'm asking. Um, that one. The when you start typing the like with the colon like and this, stuff, that's the that's, that's command line. Yeah. No. yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's okay. The, then well, yes. Command, command line. line. I always call. It. I don't know if that's the official name, but you know, I think I think command line is like when you um, when it shows you like you can run commands. In Unix, and still be in VI. Oh. All right. So you can filter here, like let's say you wanted to lowercase everything, so you do exclamation point. I mean, uh, let's see. Well, yeah. If you start with an exclamation yeah. point, then you can run. Okay. So you could, yeah, you do. Um, I don't know the shortcut, but let's say you do colon, uh, period, comma, dollar sign. That's from the beginning to the end. Um, exclamation point. I've never known how that. I've seen that by accident a few times. I'm like, what is happening? Yeah. Like, <laughs> I think there's a shortcut what for that. It what did it you didn't do, do anything right now. Yeah. You're, you're, so if you go back to it, and then you run any filter yeah. you want to it. So you can uh, try to think of uh, yeah, the dollar sign. This will mess up your code. But exclamation point, <laughs> uh, sort. Ah. Just right here. So that's command. Okay, so yeah. Mm. Yeah, you make it Yeah. <laughs> you know, how many times do you save a file when I mean I don't know, I guess I 
grew up in the day and age where you were always saving, so. Yeah, although I feel like that used to be like a default or something and it's not anymore or something. Because I, I, have, I have actually a line in my bin where I see the specific turn that all off. Yeah, it's not Because I feel like that was the default for. Unless there's a directory where they save it's outside of where I'm writing. Because I mean, you get a swap file, but that's only when you're in it. Yeah. <laughs> but because um, you can actually have it where, like, you, it, it, I don't know if there's anything at this point that the swap file gets you. It might be that it's, it was faster when. Oh, really? You turn, off, you turn off so there's no swap file? Yeah. Hmm. That'd be nice. I don't know. I don't know. I feel like the swap file's helpful a little bit. I mean, probably not anymore with memory map files, but you know, I can imagine to probably do some real old legacy stuff. Yeah. Or, I mean, I suppose in a situation like you are in where, you know, you might edit the same file at the same time, you don't necessarily want to do that, but, like, in most cases, I'm just editing on my own computer, so whenever I open it again, I'm like... Yeah. It used to be pretty good if you had a flaky connection, and it would, it would throw you out, and so you could load back in. You could it tells you where you left off, like, it's like, yeah, this well, is what you, you did. Yeah, you kind of recover, you don't lose anything. Well, I guess if you lose your connection, you probably lose, if you don't have a swap file, you lose any edits that weren't saved. Yeah. That's yeah. guaranteed months. That's not this meetup. <laughs> there was a whole VMRC um, section for TMUX, but I didn't, I didn't have enough time to read it to feel that it was, I was justified in putting it in mind for this talk anyway. Um, anything else while I've got the VIM up? That's awesome, Donna. I learned some stuff. I was, um, yeah. uh, that, that, that underline, the, what was it? The cursor? cursor line? The the cursor, cursor line. Cursor yeah, line. I haven't seen that before. That's, that's, cool. Yeah, that's great when you got lost. <laughs> that are like 300 characters. It's the long, long files, I think, yeah. that, are, that are the worst culprits. They're the worst offenders. <laughs>